The first thing that really hit me about this film was when a woman named Marlene Batley, who is a resident of within five miles of Rocky Flats, is wondering to herself, should even give milk to her children, and if that milk comes, in fact, from the cows that are near the nuclear facility. And I found that a very poignant mo moment. And, uh, Me too. And you know, the <laughs> thing that's amazing, you know, being there is every time I kept saying this, it was like an um, invasion of the body snatchers. I mean, it was like science fiction. And you would literally, you know, I would think that when I was there, I'd say, this is like a science fiction movie. And every so often, then it would come through that you'd realize, no, it's not a science fiction movie. This is really happening. And so, uh, as somebody once said, it seems as though it's a, some Steven Spielberg movie. <laughs> you know, these people are living in uh, the American dream. And um, unfortunately, it turns out to be something else. So. One of the people in it was a man, I believe his name was Don Gable. Yes. Who had a brain tumor that you could actually see. I mean, it was like this yeah, big giant. Yeah, part of his head. Yeah. He's gone. And he started off as like a really good looking guy. Yeah. I yeah. mean, really nice looking guy. And all of a sudden, I guess from the chemotherapy, he lost his hair, he got fat. And I think within six months of the filming of the sequence, he died. Yeah. And he said something that struck me so much. He, what was it, what was it that he was, where he was working near a pipe? Well, he said a comment, this guy has, as you say, part of his head is missing, and um, he begins looking almost like a rock and roll star in the film. You look at him and he's very handsome, and his story was that he was working in a radiation area and a pipe ran right by his head, and he asked his supervisor, you know, is, this is a little heavy, this is kind of going by my head, and what about my head? And the guy told him, no, it's not your head, uh, it's your body you got to worry about. <laughs> and so then he ends up with this chunk on. Well, you focused on a few places. In, uh, one was the Rocky Flats mm -hmm. near Denver and Colorado. Mm -hmm. Another was Diablo Canyon. That's right, a nuclear power plant near where, not too far from where I live. Uh huh. Well, you focused a lot on one woman named Ray. Uh, what was her last name? Fleming. Fleming. Mothers for Peace. Mm. And you got to see them planning a major demonstration, doing the demonstration, yeah. thinking, in fact, that they had kind of lost That's right, the sure. demonstration. And then somehow karma playing them a good turn. <laughs> exactly. And they didn't open this place at all. That's and right. you may remember this from the newspapers, but tell us a little bit about Ray Fleming and how did you meet her, how would you get her in this? Well, Ray Fleming is, um, is an organizer in a little town in California, San Luis Obispo, which is the home of um, the Madonna Inn, which is probably <laughs> not too well known in New York, but <laughs> is the land of um, the giant chocolate fudge sundae. It's a big tourist stop in California. It's yeah. midway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Sounds great. So <laughs> they decided that this would be a good place to build a nuclear power plant. And Ray is somebody who just began organizing uh, against the plant for quite a while. And um, in the making of the film, there actually were quite a number of stories that had tragic endings. These people would yes. become ill. These people would die. Suff yeah, die. And in the midst of it, I would, you know, it would make you crazy, it would make you a little depressed. And I found that Ray Fleming was always somebody that whenever I had contact with her, just, you know, mm -hmm. being with her, it was kind of calming. And you could see that here was somebody who could end up confronting nuclear power for 10 years, which she's done, yeah. and lost every battle, yeah. by the way. And there was something that was so calm about her sense of the power plant will never open. Mm -hmm. And I just love being around her because of that. Just That's great. Right. One, another person you focused on a lot was another woman who lived very near another nuclear facility in Rocky Flats. And her name was Marlene Batley. We brought her up before. That's right, yeah. And yeah. a lot of the story focuses on her becoming aware of the danger. And I mean, tell us a little bit what the process, what happens to her in the movie that well, didn't really change Well, in the movie, she, I mean, she is the real ethical what, crux, yeah. the ethical crux yeah. of the movie, because she's someone who begins uh, hearing about the hazard at this plant, which may or may not exist, really. You hear about it, you read it in the news, you know, and I mean, you know, what would you do in the situation, right? And um, she began to organize, and at least to find out something about what were the hazards at the plant, and where that led her and eventually was, it was just too overwhelming for her. As someone said, she went as far as an individual could go, 
and the hazard that was being posed to her children was simply too much. And she decided that she had to sell her house. And her decision and what she does with that, I think, is, for me, that's the heart of the film. Yes. Because she sort of starts out naive, then becomes a revolutionary, and then is almost a reactionary. Right. In her thinking of this whole thing. But, you know, I mean, what else could you have done, right? Really, exactly. No, it would happen to anyone in a similar situation. You can't stay either. Uh, one of the parts of it that are so interesting are these actual government footage of inside the hydrogen bomb yeah, factory. Yeah, really. Me too. I like that. And I liked a lot of it. I, I mean, I feel almost embarrassed to admit that there are certain moments of the destruction that are neat to look at. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, I, yeah. Feel, I feel terrible to say that, though. Well, but I mean, you know, you, you grew up with the mushroom cloud, right, your whole life, and it's one of those icons. I, I, I of think I have. <laughs> <laughs> but one of them includes this picture of a, a school bus that's a, a, just a really incredible mental, uh-oh. A school bus. Yeah. Well, to me, the thing that was interesting, this is a, we should take a look at the, why don't you want to take a look at the film clip? And Could maybe, we do that? Yeah. What do you think? Minor. And very fortunately, uh, I was in charge of the uh, testing program of the diagnostics part. Sterling Colgate remembers atomic testing differently. As well as he was 40 miles away. But when you're testing a device, we call it a device in order to remove ourselves from the implications of warfare. Uh, it, it's just absolutely an incredible rush. Here you are 40 miles away from this atoll that's going to go. You see this vast expanding sphere of light getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it just seems to envelop the whole blooming sky with this, this, this incredible fireball. And again, you keep reminding yourself you're 40 miles away from this thing. And if you're, you know, if you're into explosions, as most of us were when we were kids, you know, and we've had to get away from it as we got older. Uh, fortunately, I haven't because I've since gone into astrophysics to keep it up and worry about supernova and quasars and universi. But here's this thing getting absolutely immense. It's covering the whole blooming sky. And you know it was a small point of explosion 40 miles away. For more than 35 years, the United States has been conducting a bizarre series of atomic tests. The strangest test that isn't still a secret is the pig test, codenamed Priscilla. To determine the effects of an atomic blast on human skin, the Army bought 700 pigs and designed special uniforms for them. The pigs were tied in raised pens and subjected to the heat, radiation, and blast of an atomic bomb. was written off as a failure. Unlike people, the pigs managed